baby on the deals, Nick. Okay. Um, parallel execution. Uh, so what's missing here on the slides is that uh, I'll send an announcement on, on Piazza. I, given that we've sort of people are struggling with the, the second project, finishing that up, I bumped a bunch, a bunch of the other deadlines to give you more time for the, the later stuff. So uh, homework four will be due like a week or so after it's normally due now. And then same thing for project three and four. Okay, I'll, I'll post this on Piazza. For the, uh, for the, 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 the database updates, or the database talks coming uh, in the next two weeks. So next week, we, or this week we have on Thursday, the, the guys from Blazing DB down in Texas are coming up to give a tech talk. Um, and then Bright Light is out of London or Norway, I think, and they're coming uh, on November 1st to give a talk. So again, I'll, I'll send an announcement about that on, on Piazza. All right, so today we're talking about parallel execution. So everything we've talked about so far in, in the semester has, has mostly focused on single-threaded operations. Right, we did talk about doing concurrent updates or concurrent operations on the B plus tree, um, but now we want to talk about how we are going to execute queries uh, in parallel, what the kind of op optimizations we can do with this. So it sort of goes obvious and goes without saying, but why would you want to actually run things in parallel? Right, Oops, sorry. Um, right, because we get, we get performance benefits. That's the key thing, right? We'll be able to uh, run queries more efficiently because we, now we can break it up across multiple cores and multiple storage devices. Um, and we'll, you know, we'll get faster latency and, and better response times. The system would end up being looking more responsive. And we'll see this when we talk about transactions. When we have multiple threads updating the database, if you have to go get a page from the buffer pool and the buffer pool doesn't have it, you have to stall and go out the disk. You want to let other things keep running and, and still make forward progress. So, right. so this is sort of the, the, the state of the world that we live in now. Moore's law is over. We're, our CPUs are getting more cores. We're getting more storage devices. Right? Cloud storage is cheap. So we want to take, all, take advantage of all these things inside of our database system. So the, for this lecture, we're going to focus on parallel databases. Um, we'll have two lectures at the end of the semester talking about distributed databases, and I'll cover what the difference is between these two of them. But the, the high-level way to think about parallel and distributed databases are that to the application programmer, the person writing SQL and submitting them to the system, a parallel database or distributed database is going to look like a single database instance. right? Like you open up the terminal and you start writing queries to it, you don't know that the database is split up across you know, multiple cores or multiple, you know, uh, multiple machines, right? It all looks the same to you. And this is the beauty of SQL in a declarative language, right? You just say, hey, run this query, and it doesn't matter whether it's a single node or a thousand nodes, the database system can take that single query and figure out what the best way to execute it is for you. So that's the beauty of what we're going to, uh, of SQL. We, we need to take advantage of this now inside of our system. So the, the, the distinction or the difference between parallel databases and distributed databases that I like to make is the way to think about this is a parallel database is one where the, the nodes, and I'll use the term node loosely, the nodes are physically close to each other. Right? A node could be a, a, a CPU socket, a node could be a whole other machine, but the idea is that these, these machines are close to each other and communicate uh, very efficiently. And so because we're assuming that they're close to each other, then we don't have to worry about un unreliable communication. Right, so think of like the, the most simplest parallel machine could be a single socket CPU that has four cores or two cores. Right, that's a parallel database system. A distributed database typically are ones where the nodes can be are far away from each other. So far away could be you know, in the same, you know, the same data center, across town, or different geographical region. Right? And in these environments, the Typically, you're going to be connecting to them over a public network. If you're inside of Amazon's data center, then it's, it's a private network, but, but it's still not the same as like two sockets in the same box together. And so in a distributed database, we're not going to be able to ignore the communication costs right, of you know, sending data from one node to the next. And that also means that we can't assume that the communication is reliable. And we'll see this later on in the semester when we talk about doing transactions over, over a distributed database. You know, this changes how you actually set up some of your algorithms because you can't assume that I send a message to somebody, they're going to get it in the right order that, that I expect them to get it. And so in, for today's class, we're focused on parallel data. We're not gonna, we don't have to worry about that problem at all. The question is really how can we take advantage of 
uh, additional resources to execute our queries more efficiently. So the two, type of, two types of parallelism we're going to talk about are interquery parallelism and interquery parallelism. So interquery, interquery parallelism is essentially what most people think about uh, in a parallel database is I can run multiple queries at the same time, and they're going to run on different threads or different cores. Right? And again, we do this because we want to you know, improve our throughput and latency. We don't want to have everyone stymied or blocked on this one thread that's executing queries one after another. Intro query parallelism is where we're going to take the operations of a single query, I think of a single query plan, and we're going to execute those operations in, in parallel. This either could be, and we'll see this in, in a second, be a horizontal parallelism where we're taking the same operator for executing in parallel on multiple threads, or vertical parallelism where we can execute two different operators on two, two different threads at the same time. And so this would be more useful in analytical queries or long-running queries. We have to scan a lot of data and crunch over a lot, a lot of tuples, right? Because you're usually going to be I/O bound or CPU bound in these in these in these environments. And so by having additional parallelism, you you get better performance. All right. So to begin, we're going to talk about different process models, a way to, de to design a parallel database system. Um, then we'll actually talk about how you execute operators in in parallel. And then we'll finish up talking about how we can build our system out to get I.O. parallelism. OK? All right, so the, the database systems process model defines how the system is going to be designed to take advantage of additional resources and execute multiple requests from the applications in parallel. Right? And so instead of using the term thread or process or uh, you know, core, I'm going to try to use the word worker. Right? Because that can really mean either you know, a, a bunch of different uh, entities executing something in, in our system. So the idea is that we're going to have some worker in our database system that's going to be responsible for executing tasks, and I'll define what tasks are in a second, for our queries. And we want our workers to be able to run in parallel. Right? So the three ways you can architect a database system is that you can have a single process, like an OS process per database worker. You can have a process pool where you have to, can dispatch work to those, those uh, workers. And then you can have a, a single thread per, per database worker. And there's trade-offs for all of these. So the first one is process per worker. And again, the idea is that a single OS process corresponds to one worker. Uh, typically, again, it can, it can be a single thread for that process. And we're going to rely on the operating system scheduler to decide what, you know, what process runs next, or which one has higher priority over, over another. So the idea is that, say this is your application, you have something in, in, the, in the front called a, like a dispatcher, or a coordinator, or Postgres calls this the postmaster. Uh, and the application sends a request to the dispatcher and says, hey, I want to execute this query. Uh, tell me who's going to do it for me. And the dispatcher will, will hand this request off to a, a free worker. And then the worker comes back and tells the application, hey, but I, I got your request. Here's my socket if you want to talk to me. Here's where you can send me all, all the requests that, that, you know, that, you, that you want me to execute. And then now it's responsible for the worker to, to interact with the database to execute your query and then send you back results. So this was the approach that most systems were using back in the old days, the 70s and 80s. Uh, this is what IBM DB2 does. This is what Oracle does. This is what Ingress does. This is what Postgres does, right? Let me take a guess why this is the most common approach in the old days. Yes. The CPU is only one core. He says the CPU is only one core. Uh, think of what, why would you want to do this instead of threads? Maybe put it that way. Think of the 1980s, right? Was Linux around? No. Did was was POSIX as prevalent as it is now? No. Right. So there was no there were no pthreads. Right. There wasn't a standard threading library. All of these different versions of Unix had their own threading packages. So that if you wrote a multi-thread application for one operating system like BSD, and then you want to run on VAX, you probably can't use the same threading package. Right? But the, the basic concept of a process it would exist in all these different operating systems. So this is why most of these systems in the old, in the old days were, were implemented this way. So an extension of this is use a process pool. 
And the idea is that you still have the dispatcher, you still have something in, in the front, um, but it's responsible for just handing things off to whatever worker is free, and then it, it can go ahead and, and, and execute it. Right? This is sort of a better implementation of, of the, the single process, single worker per process. Um, and this is used by IBM DB2, and it's also used as of uh, 2015, the latest version of Postgres now you sort of use this sort of model. They can have one worker communicate with another worker to hand, hand it off work. The most common approach that, uh, that, that is used today, and you know, if you're building a new database system from scratch, this is probably what, what you would use, is you just have a single process for your database system, and you just have multiple threads. And internally, you're, you know how to dispatch work to those threads, and you do scheduling and other things that the other approaches with processes would have to rely on the operating system to use. And everything's in the same address space, so you don't have to worry about using shared memory to communicate or, or in, in inter-process communication to communicate with different processes. You can just write into memory and, and any other thread can, can read it. So as I said, this is the most common approach. Every single new database system written in the last 10 years uh, is going to be using this, with the exception of any system that's based on Postgres, because Postgres is based on the process model. So there's a lot of systems that took Postgres, hacked it up, and, and put out you know, you know, a, a, an optimized version of it. And they're going to inherit the, the, the process model from, from Postgres. So when we actually still first started building our own system here at, D, uh, at CMU, we did what everyone else does. We start with Postgres, rip out the bottom half, and, and use the top half. But we decided that to get away from all the, the process model, we actually ended up rewriting uh, Postgres to use, multi th uh, use, use multiple threads, use threading model. Um, and I have seen some posts on like, the Postgres uh, uh, like message board, people talking about, uh, what, you know, is it worth time for us looking at switch to a multi-threaded model? Because the advantage is the context switch in, inside of a multi-threaded application is much cheaper than going across different processes. So again, uh, the, in my opinion, the multi-threaded approach is the better way to do this. Uh, again, you have less, less overhead from a context switch. You don't have to worry about using shared memory. Um, the obviously the downside is if you have a rogue thread that fucks things up and you crash, you know, that thread crashes, you take down the whole thing. Whereas in a process model approach, uh, the process per worker approach, if one worker crashes, then only that process is killed. The whole thing can still stay up. So uh, the other thing I'll point out too is just because you have a, uh, you know, a single, you use the thread pool worker model doesn't mean that you automatically get intra-query parallelism. Right? So MySQL uses multiple threads, but they can still only execute, at least as of 5.7, still can only execute a, a one query with one thread. They can't take a query and break it up across multiple threads. Right? And Postgres actually uses the process model, and they actually now support intra-query parallelism. So there's a bunch of other stuff we have to deal with, as you can imagine. In when we have a multi-threaded environment, a multi-process environment, in terms of scheduling, right? So there's a bunch of other stuff we have to decide in our database system, like who, sh you know, who to hand off tasks to, how much resources those tasks should get, what cores or CPU cores we should assign workers to. Right? All of these things we're not going to cover in this class. We'll cover in the advanced class. But the way to think about it is the same kind of scheduling that an operating system has to do uh, about for its processes and its threads running in, in the system. We want to do the same kind of thing in our database system because we know what the threads are actually doing. We, we know what data they're, they're touching, and we, we can be smarter about how we organize things. Again, because the data system always knows more. Yes? So for the process model, what's the advantage of the process pool? So this question is, for the process model, what is the advantage of the, the, the worker pool versus the process per worker? Yeah. Um, the idea, so the, the advantage is for this one here, for one query shows up in this worker, that worker is the only thing, person that can ex execute it, right? In this one here, you could have free workers that the query shows up to this guy here, but he could say, all right, well, I know these other guys are free here, so let me hand off one, one piece of my work to them, and they'll execute it, and then send the result back to me. Right, again, so the, this one would be one worker equals one query, this one could be one query could be used across executed across multiple workers, and obviously you can do the same thing in 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 the thread pool, th the threading model approach. Okay, so the 
But as I said, the two type of parallelism we can have are inner query parallelism and intra query parallelism. So inner query parallelism just means that we're going to have multiple threads, multiple queries be able to run at the same times uh, in, our, in our system. If everything's read only in this environment, then this is this is super easy to do because we don't have to worry about any of the threads coordinating with, or, or workers coordinating with each other. You know, this guy can run this query, I can run my query, and we don't have to worry about you know them modifying anything. It's when you have uh, queries updating the database at the same time, that's when trouble starts, and that's where you need something like a current control protocol, which we'll discuss next week, to make sure that each worker only reads the data that they're supposed to be reading. Right? We, don't want to, we potentially don't want to read data from one worker before it has actually saved anything in, you know, in, in another worker. So the idea is that a concurrent protocol is going to have, allow us to give the illusion that each worker is running in the database by itself, even though they're not really. Again, this is really hard. This is the thing that excites me the most in databases, and we'll, we'll, we'll discuss more of this next week. For intro query parallelism, right, the idea is, again, for a single query, can we break up its, 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 its tasks into sort of subtasks and run those in parallel? The two approaches to do are intraoperator parallelism and interoperator parallelism. And what I'll say is that these techniques are not, not mutually exclusive. Just because you're using the first approach doesn't mean you can't also use the second approach. Where, but most people actually only use the first approach. And for all the algorithms that we've talked about so far, to do joins, to do sorting, to do scans, there are parallel versions of all of these. Right? Basically, just think about do a hash join. Instead of having one thread scan the table and build a hash table, you could have different threads scan at the same time and build the same hash table together. And of course, now you need latches to protect, protect them from each other. So again, we'll go through these two approaches one by one. So intraoperative parallelism is also sometimes called horizontal parallelism. And the idea is that for a single sort of high-level logical operator in our query plan, like scan table A, we're going to instantiate multiple instances of that operator and then execute them in parallel. And then we're going to introduce a new type of operator called the exchange operator that's going to be a sort of a, 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 a barrier that checks to see whether all the subtasks for our, our single operator are completed. And if so, then we can then pass along the, the results to, to the next operator in our query plan. So the exchange operator was introduced in the late 1980s, early 1990s, from the same author that did the volcano uh, stuff we talked about before. Remember the iterator model said it also could be called the volcano. Right? This all comes from the same paper, and this, the same paper also introduces this exchange operator. And in most parallel databases, they have something like this that, that you would use to combine things together. And this is also approach is also used in, in distributed databases as well. So let's say we have our query here. We want to do a join on A and B, and we have a filter on A and a filter on B. Right? So this query plan I'm showing here, this is like the logical view of the query plan. We're not saying anything about what algorithms are using. We're not saying anything about uh, you know, where the data is actually stored. But now we can instantiate multiple. When we actually go to execute it, we can instantiate these different operators in parallel with each other. So take the first thing of this scan on A. So we can say that we're going to break it up into three subtasks, A1, two, A, A1, A2, A3, that are each going to be assigned to a single worker, like a single, single, single thread. And they're going to scan disjoint subsets of the table and then pass them up to the, the next operator in the query plan. Right? But actually, we can do some pipelining here because we see that immediately after the scan, we're going to do our filter. Right, where a value is less than 999, or a value is less than 99. So, in addition to doing the scan, we'll also feed the output into a, a parallel version of the filter, which then feeds the data up even further. So now, again, since we know we have to join in for that, each of these guys can then build the hash table. We'll build a single global hash table for all these threads. We'll just use latches to protect them, and then now this then gets fed up into an exchange operator. Again, think of this just as a barrier. There's, it's just a, it's a sort of physical construct inside of our query plan execution that has no corresponding uh, logical operator in relational algebra. It's just something internally we're using to synchronize the different threads and say, we can't go past in a query plan until we get the result from all our, our subtasks. Right? Just think there's a counter inside this thing that says, I know I have three subtasks, 
And every single time this guy, this one of these tasks completes and tells the exchange operator, hey, I'm done, I don't have any more data to give you, then you decrement that counter by one. Then when the counter is zero, then you can take whatever this thing has coalesced together and feed it up to the next operator. All right, so we can do the same thing for B. Say B is a smaller table, and so maybe we only want to give it two cores or two workers to execute this. And they'll just again, do the same thing. They'll scan in parallel, do the filter, and say we're doing the grace hash join, where we want to partition this. And so we'll partition these guys into to separate buckets. Um, and then we have an exchange operator that says, hey, when you're done, you know, uh, you know, once all the subtests are done, then we can go complete this. So when this exchange operator is done, we have a hash table. When this exchange operator is done, we have our buckets. And then in the, once these two exchange operators are done together, we can then actually now do the join. And again, we do this join in parallel because we've split the, the, the data up over here. And we can now do our probe on our hash table on the different threads and produce our output. And the same thing, you have exchange operator above that as a counter that says, when my four subtasks complete, then I get my final result. So is this clear, right? It's just, it's a construct inside, inside the execution of this query plan that allows us to coalesce the results from these subtasks on these workers so that anything above it doesn't have to know that it was executed in parallel. It just knows that I got all the data that I, I needed, right? Because without this, then this thread might run faster than this thread. So I might start executing things above in my query plan before I've processed all the data that I needed. So I may, not, I may, may end up getting false negatives or false positives. Yes? Uh, why on the B part, B is partitioned? Uh, right, so, so you, I mean, you, you could, you could sp the way to think about this is you could split up this input uh, so that the, all the data that this thing would ever have to, have to access in one of these th threads up here would be all within a single partition so that you're only mostly hitting the, the same part of the hash table inside this, so you get better cache locality. So is that like a hash table as well? It's, it's like the grace hash join. Oh, okay. Or a, a variant of this. No it's a variant of it. It's partitioned. OK. So that's, that's intraoperator parallelism. Again, the idea is that we're taking an operator we would normally execute on a single thread and just breaking it up across multiple threads. So with interoperator parallelism or vertical parallelism, the idea, idea here is that we're going to execute our operator and it doesn't have to be a single thread, but for our purposes, we'll say it is. For each operator, it will be assigned to a single worker that'll just be always running, and it'll spit up output to the next, you know, takes, takes an input, does whatever computation it wants on it, and then spits it up to the next operator when it's done. And then now we can have these different workers running in parallel, these different operators. And, then, and I think your textbook calls this pipeline parallelism. So we just take our example from before, the same query, and say we take this join operator, we don't care what comes below us, what, what's actually feeding data into us, but we'll just assign this to a single worker that's just going to again iterate over the inner table and the outer table, however it gets it, and then when it has a result, it emits it as, as the output up above. And then in another worker, we're going to have a uh, uh, you know, thread spinning over and doing our, our projection on any data that comes out of this. So again, we'll have one thread spin down here, another thread spin down here. And anything that gets this input, it is just the computation and spits it as the output, right? And then again, for every single operator in my query plan, I could assign them to a different worker. So what's the obvious problem with this? Yes? Two can only go as fast as one. Exactly, it says two can only go as fast as one. So this top guy here, He's just going to sit and wait until he, it gets data to, to, to crunch on, right? So we're sort of assigning a worker to this task, but it doesn't have anything to do. You know, it's not going to do, a, you know, hopefully not doing a busy loop and just burning cycles that way, but it's essentially we've allocated resources that can't be used. So as far as I know, no sort of traditional relational database management system does vertical parallelism. Right? Everyone always does the, the horizontal parallelism. Where you see this kind of parallelism show up is uh, in what are called either stream processing systems or continuous query systems. Think of something like I have, a, I, have a, I have a SQL query, I give it to my system, and it's just always running 
listening on a stream of, stream of updates from some outside source, like think of like Kafka or something. And it's just always running, uh, and anytime a new query comes in, then it run, runs it through the, the pipeline and processes it. So you see this approach used in uh, Spark Streaming, NiFi, Kafka, Storm, Flink, and Heron. Uh, it doesn't make sense in sort of an ad hoc query system because the, ex the exact thing he said, because you're, the operators above in the tree don't, aren't going to have any work to do. So you're basically wasting resources. But in a continuous query system, in a streaming system, there's data coming in all the time. So you're always going to have some, something to do. OK? All right. So the, everything we talked about so far has been all about how do we take our query plan and break it up into subtasks and run those subtasks on, on additional workers, additional computational uh, horsepower that we have available to us. But the obvious problem is going to be that if we had to ever get data from disk, then it doesn't matter how many CPU cores we have, the disk is always going to be the main bottleneck because this is going to be way slower than, than, uh, you know, than everything else. And actually, in some cases, if we have a lot of threads trying to read data from disk at the same time, then we can actually get even worse performance because if we have a mechanical drive, then there's an arm jumping around the different points in the platter, and that's going to be e even slower. So we need to figure out how can we parallelize our, our, our input data, or the access methods to get data from uh, non-volatile storage and bring it into our buffer pool as quickly as possible. So this is what IO parallelism is, is attempting to solve. And the idea here is that we're going to take our database management system installation, right? not database itself, but actually the, the system installation itself, and split up its data that is storing across multiple storage devices so that we can issue these requests in, in parallel. And there's a bunch of different ways that you can approach this. right? You can take uh, a single database and have it be stored across multiple disks. You can have one, one database per disk. You can have one relation per disk, or you can split up the, a single relation across these multiple disks using partitioning or sharding. Right? So the, the easiest way to do this without changing any code in our database system is to do multi-disk parallelism. And this is just where we, we just configure the hardware or the operating system to take multiple drives and multiple disks and then have them appear as a single logical disk to the database system. So the database, our database system code doesn't know that we're doing, uh, that we're, when we do a write, or a read to our disk device that it's actually multiple disk devices that could be servicing our request. It just to us, it looks like a single device. So we can get this through our storage appliance. So if you buy a expensive box that has a bunch of drives together, do this for you. Um, or you can do this through using RAID. Right? Everyone, everyone here should, should have heard of RAID before, right? Good. Okay. So the basic idea of RAID is, is, is you want to make a bunch of cheap devices, or not cheap, much, much of independent storage devices appear as a single single device. And the two most common ways to do this are RAID 0, which is striping, where this is we have uh, three different devices and six different pages, and each device is just in charge of, of storing that each, each one of those pages. So now when my request shows up from a database system and says, give me page 1, there's some controller or the operating system knows that here's the device that actually has the data that you want to go get it. right? The alternative is to do RAID, RAID 1, or mirroring, where each now device has a complete copy of, of the database. And so now when I want to do a read for page 1, any one of these three devices can service me. So now if you have you know, one guy's reading page 1, one guy's reading page 2, you can uh, have one device do handle one request and one device handle another request. Again, the key thing here is that this is all transparent to the database system. We don't know anything about these things being stored in different locations. We just know that there's this one file or one, one table heap we can read and write from. If we now start moving into our data system and say, well, what can we actually do to make things run faster by controlling where this data is actually being stored? Right, this is called uh, database partitioning. And the idea here, remember we talked about the page directory would maintain information about for a given page or, 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 or table heap, what file or what directory were that, was that data actually being stored? This is where we can start to do this, you know, take advantage of different devices at that level. Right, so the idea here is that uh, we, when we go fetch a page, we would do some lookup and figure out, well, what, what device actually has our page? And we then we can, we can multiplex them and be smart about storing different data that's maybe used together often on different pages so that we're not trying to saturate the this, this single device. 
There's some tricky things we have to handle in this environment. We won't talk about logging just, just yet, but now you have the problem of say, I'm, I'm modifying data on two different storage devices. Where do I actually put the log, keep track of what those changes are? Um, and there's and a bunch of different things we, we can cover when we talk about logging later in the semester. So partitioning or table partitioning, the idea here is that we're going to split a single logical table into these disjoint subsets or segments that we can then store and, and manage separately in different locations on different disks. So again, ideally, we want this to be transparent to the application. Right? We don't want to write, we don't, we don't have, to have the, the user write SQL statements that, that are designed to go to a particular storage device, because that way we can move things around underneath the covers without, anything, without making any changes to our application. So most of the time when people, like, this is probably still common, but a lot of times people start off using MySQL and they hit the limit what they can do with MySQL on a single box. So they end up doing what is called sharding, where they have this middleware layer that can route queries to the actual storage device that has the data that they want, the MySQL installation that has what they want. Like Facebook is the most famous one for doing this. Google used to do this as well. Um, ideally, we don't want to have to have that application code or middleware write ourselves. We want the data system to do this for us automatically. Right? And some, some, some systems can actually do this, other ones cannot. So there's two types of partitioning we can do. Again, we'll cover this more in detail when we talk about da distributed databases, but the high level idea is still the same. So this first is called vertical partitioning, is that we're gonna split the table's attributes into different locations or di different files in different storage devices. And whenever we need to get all the data we need to reconstruct the tuple, we know how to do fetches to, do th to those different locations. Right, so in the same in this case here, attribute four is really big, and the other three attributes are small. So maybe what we'll do is have all this data here stored in one partition, and then the, the remaining three attributes are stored in another partition. And then any query that I write against this table knows how to stitch these things back together. What does this sound like? We talked about this before. Column, Column store, right? Same idea, right? This is actually a very common approach. Actually, Wikipedia uses this, right? Wikipedia has the, for all your revisions, you have actually the text of the revision, then you have the metadata about the revision. They actually store them in actually separate tables and essentially is doing vertical partition. It's sort of like a poor man's column store. What most people think about when we talk about partitioning is usually what is called horizontal partitioning. Or if you're coming from a NoSQL system, this is what they call sharding. The idea is that we're going to take all the attributes of a single tuple and store them in a single location, but we're gonna split up what, you know, what, what tuples are stored in what location, right? So in this case here, we have four tuples. We'll put two tuples in partition two and two tuples in partition one, and then we have some additional uh, information inside our system when a query shows up and says, oh, I want data at, for this key. I know how to go to the, to the right partition and get that data that I want. Again, we can store these to different partitions on different files on disk and different storage devices or even different machines, right? And so the way you can split this up, we'll, we'll cover about later, is you can just do simple things like take a, take a single attribute and hash it and that decides what partition you're gonna go to. You can do range partitioning or predicate partitioning, right, more complicated things. Different data systems do different things uh, and different workloads want different things. So for OATP, when you're doing like single key lookups, hash partitioning works great because you just take whatever key they're looking up, hash it, and that tells you what partition to go to. For doing OLAP queries, then that may not be the right thing to do. Okay? I'm sort of rushing through this, but I think a high level idea, it, it should be pretty straightforward. All right, so parallel execution is important. Almost every single data system will actually do this. And all the stuff I, I glossed over in a, in a big way, like how to coordinate different threads, and how to schedule their operations, We'll, some of this we'll cover in next week when we talk about concurrency control, and some of, some of this we'll cover in, in the advanced class. All right, so next class uh, on Wednesday, uh, it's sort of a potpourri lecture. We'll talk about different ways to embed logic inside our database system to make it do more complicated things than we can do just through SQL. So we'll talk about store procedures, user defined functions, triggers, views. But the idea here is that going to be Instead of having all the logic for our application inside of our application, we can push some of this inside of our database system and have that run more efficiently there because we're closer to the data. I mean, we don't have to go back and forth. Okay? All right, so in the last three minutes, I want to talk about the extra credit assignment. So the issue we're doing for extra credit is that you can earn 10% uh, uh, in, in your final grade 
if you write an article for a online encyclopedia that we've been working on uh, called the databases of databases. Uh, so the idea is that we want to write a sort of an academic style technical article about one particular database system, pick whatever one you want, uh, and you provide citations about you know how to explain how it's actually implemented, what's going on on the inside. Right, so, so I don't care about you know sort of marketing things to say, oh, it's fast. I really care about how does it actually implement concurrent control, how does it actually implement logging or indexes or buffer pool management. The things that we've been talking about in this course, that's the kind of stuff I want in, in, in this article. So uh, the website is dbdb.io, dbdb right? So I'm currently aware of 560 different database systems. And you, there's like a search panel to say, you know, show me all the different database systems that are that use two-phase locking or use B plus trees. And then for each of them, there'll be an article that sort of summarizes the major points about, about their implementation. Right? So the way this is going to work is I'm going to post on Piazza a sign-up page, uh, a spreadsheet on, um, on Google Docs. Pick whatever data system you, you want to write about. I'll have a list of ones where we already have articles from previous years, so you can't choose those. And then, uh, you know, if it's, I'll help you sort of guide you to say, you know, here's here's what I expect for what you need to fill out for or a complete article, right? So if you pick something super common, like Oracle, then there will be a ton of information about this. So I expect the article to be very uh, comprehensive and complete. If you pick an obscure one uh, that no one's ever heard of that's defunct, um, then you may have a hard time finding information, and that's okay. But you know, we, we, I want to know this ahead of time so we can, you know, set your expectations for uh, how much work it's going to take you to do this. So it's, it's up to you to pick whatever database system you want, right? As I said, I am personally aware of 560 different database systems. So you will have no problem finding a database system that will be interesting to you, right? Do you care about graph databases? Do you care about distributed databases? Do you care about in-memory databases? Do you care about databases written in China? Do you care about databases that are written in the US? Right? I've tried to annotate all these different systems so you can just go and pick what, whatever one is actually interesting to you. Okay? So if you find a database system that I'm not aware of, please, please let me know because we want to add it to, to the list. I, I spent the summer looking at old like, Usen, uh, like Usenic posts um, from like 1990s to find like guys in their basement writing a database system and we have them listed in, in the system. Okay? So if you can't find a system that interests you, something's wrong with you, right? <laughs> All right, and again, it goes without saying, please do not steal, please do not plagiarize, do not take their documentation and copy and paste it directly into, their, into the article, right? You have to provide citations for all the information that you add to this, right? If you say, in this data system, you use two-phase locking, I need a citation to the documentation that says they actually do this, okay? All right, so I'll post the sign-up sheet on Piazza. It's first come, first serve for, for the different databases, you know, what database you want to pick. And again, I'll have the list of ones that you're not, not allowed to pick because we've already done them. Um, and then we will uh, I'll, I'll post on the website, you know, further instructions with information about how you actually, you know, what should be expected in the article and what the different categories of features mean. Okay? Any questions? <laughs> That's my favorite all time. <laughs> Yes, it's the S-T Cricket I-D-E-S I make a mess unless I can do it like a Geo Ice Cube with the G to the E to the T Now here comes, dude I play the game where there's no rules the Homies on the cut, so I'm a fool cause I drink brew Quick to bust a cap on the eyes, bro Bushwick on the go with a flow to the eyes, show. Here I come, Willie D, that's me Rolling with Fifth Watt, South Park and South Central, G And St. Eyes when I party by the 12 pack case of the four. Six pack 40 act gets the real bounce. I drink fruit, but yo, I drink it by the 12 ounce. They say Bill makes you fat. But St. Eyes is straight, so it really don't matter. <laughs>